Good evening. Welcome to the Faculty of Education Community Speaker Series Talk, Let's Talk Education for 2018. Um, before we begin, let's get a sense of who's here. Uh, how many people here are um, teachers from one of the local school boards? Oh, good, yeah, good representation of teachers. Uh, how many people are parents of young children? Great. Um, you can be in more than one of these categories, right? <laughs> How about uh, students from Western University? Yes, some people are in all three categories, right? Uh, and faculty members from Western University? Good. Great. Well, welcome. Um, I, tonight, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Daniel Ansari. He's our community speaker for 2018. Um, Daniel is a neuroscientist and a cognitive developmental psychologist, and he's one of the world's leading researchers in the area of the development of mathematical cognition. Um, Daniel is, um, <laughs> yeah, in Daniel's research, he investigates a number of questions, including um, how does mathematical understanding develop in young children? Uh, how should we assess mathematical understanding in young children? Um, why is it that some children have difficulty learning mathematics? And also, how can we make the teaching of mathematics to young children more effective? Um, Daniel is the past president of the Society for Mind, Brain, and Education and a asso uh, past associate editor of the Journal of Mind, Brain, and Education. Um, Daniel's published over 100 journal articles and his work has been cited over by other researchers over 9,000 times. So, so he's a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Daniel's also a co-investigator on Western's Brain Scan Brain Health for Life uh, project. Um, Daniel's topic today will be building blocks of mathematical competence, evidence from brain behavior. <coughs> um, please join me in welcoming Daniel. Thank you, Perry. Thank you for that nice introduction. It's uh, great to see so many of you out here tonight. I mean, I know it's uh, the weeknight. It's uh, for some of you probably parking difficulties downtown and so on. So I appreciate uh, you all being here. Um, yeah, as Perry said, I want to talk a little bit about our work on building blocks of mathematical competence, but also the work of other researchers in this field. I think it's fair to say that in everyday life we don't necessarily reflect as much on how much we use our numerical knowledge and our numerical abilities. I think we think about math and numbers as something that children have to learn when they go through formal education and that some people might apply in context of specific uh, uh, jobs, for example engineers. But it's actually true that we use our numbers and our numerical abilities in everyday lives. And if you don't have those numerical abilities, then you're going to struggle in everyday situations. So let's consider a few scenarios. Let's say you're going to the grocery store. You want to ensure that your family is healthy. It's a busy Thursday evening. Maybe right after this lecture, you rush into uh, a local uh, superstore and you just pick up a bunch of apples. In that case, you're not really precisely counting them out, but you have some sense of how many apples you've put into that bag, and you have some estimate that that is going to be sufficient number of fruit for your family uh, for the rest of the week. Then let's say it's Saturday morning, you go to the Western Fair uh, farmer's market, and now you have a lot of time, and uh, you tell the person who's serving you that you want five apples, and then they go on to count that out exactly. In both of those instances, you're using your sense of number and your numerical abilities, but I would say that most of us don't really reflect on the fact that we're using numbers in those kinds of everyday situations. Another scenario is every morning when you wake up, uh, you process numerical information, and that indirectly informs your uh, decision-making and your behavior. So if it's Saturday morning, you might say, oh, I'll press the snooze button or sleep for another hour. But if it's, a, if it's a Monday morning and your first meeting is 8.30, that's going to lead to a lot of arousal. And that arousal is directly driven by processing the numerical information that's on your alarm clock. 
When we open the newspaper, we process lots of numbers. Uh, maybe tomorrow morning, either when you read the London Free Press or your newspaper of choice, either online or in print, reflect a little bit on how much numerical information is contained in each one of the news items that you read. And in order for us to, do, to, to efficiently read, therefore, and process that information, we need to have a solid understanding of numbers and how numbers and quantities uh, refer to one another. Of course, we also process the weather, and these days that's a very pleasant thing to look at. But I believe just a few months ago it wasn't so pleasant and informed rather different behaviors and decision making in terms of what to wear, how many layers, and so forth. And then this is outdated, unfortunately. I prepared this very <laughs> slide two days ago, so I know this is uh, updated now. But uh, numbers also play a great uh, emotional role. You know, if you're rooting for the Winnipeg Jets, then you're following this kind of inf inf information very closely. And not just the scoreline, but the performance of individual players, how their performance evolves over time. And all of that involves processing numerical information. And then there are numbers, you know, that just seem to have long-term repercussions <laughs> on the entire planet, such as uh, the election results from the 2016 election. But we're here today to talk about children and children's math development, so I want to ask the question, how important are early numerical skills? You know, we knew, I think it's fair to say that over the past uh, three or even four decades, there's been a tremendous emphasis on literacy. And that emphasis on literacy has led to some really good translation of what we know about how children learn how to read into reading instruction. You know, we now understand what are some of the best ways to teach children how to read. And that's really been driven by, I think, the acknowledgement that reading is not just important for being able to process information, but it's important for all aspects of learning and education and daily functioning and being able to be an effective, successful and happy member of your society. But what about early numerical skills? How important are they? And especially compared to reading, how important are they? Well, an answer to this was provided in a very nice paper by Greg Duncan in 2007 called School Readiness and Later Achievement. I should say Greg Duncan and his many colleagues from all over the world including colleagues from here in Canada, from, uh, uh, from Montreal. And what these uh, researchers did was to say, OK, let's combine all the longitudinal studies that we have, that is, studies that follow children from an early age, assess their reading, their math abilities, their socio-emotional abilities, at various points throughout their developmental trajectory, throughout their lifespan. And using this data set, we can now ask how much do the early numerical skills and the early reading skills count when it comes to explaining how well children do later on? So if you measure children's math and reading abilities, let's say in junior or in senior kindergarten, does that tell us anything about how well these children do in grade six or even in grade eight? And what they found is summarized in this slide, and I appreciate it might look a little bit overwhelming and there's a lot of things going on here, but let me take you through this. Each one of these triangles is essentially a, what we refer to as a correlation, a relationship between the early measures of reading, math, attention, internalizing, externalizing, and social skills, and in this case, correlating with their later math abilities. And the higher the triangle, the stronger the relationship between the early skills and the later skills. And what you can see from this is that early reading does a fairly good job in predicting how well children will do in math later on. And early math also does a quite good job in predicting how well children will do in math later on. So this tells us then that both early reading and early math skills can tell us something about how well children will do in the future. This wasn't so much the case for skills such as attention, internalizing, externalizing, and social skills. You can see here that the relationship between these skills measured early on and later abilities wasn't as strong as the relationship between early reading and early math when it comes to later math. That's, of course, not to say that attention, internalizing, externalizing, and social skills aren't important for child development. They just don't seem to be very important for explaining how well, well children do later on in math. But the real surprise from this study, perhaps the most surprising and somewhat unexpected finding from this study, came when they looked at what predicts later reading abilities. So again, each one of these squares now is a correlation, the relationship between the early skills and later reading skills. 
And what you can probably see from the data plotted here is that early math was as good a predictor of later reading skills as was early reading. And indeed, when they asked what is the strongest overall predictor early on of later academic achievement, it turned out to be early math. So these data nicely show then that early math seems to tell us something about how well children will do later on in various academic abilities, not just in math, but also in reading. We don't yet fully understand what explains that strong relationship between early math and later reading abilities, but it does suggest that math might be capturing something and what children learn in math might be uh, capturing something that goes beyond just learning uh, the content knowledge in mathematics and might help them with other uh, 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 skills as well. So this sort of recognition then that early math skills really do count and that how well children do early on tells us something about how well they will do later in development, I think has led to a lot of people, including myself and the people in my lab, uh, to ask questions about the early foundations. Can we better characterize what are some of the building blocks of mathematical competence early on? Uh, can we characterize those foundational skills? Because these foundational skills presumably act as a sort of scaffold for children's number development and their later developing mathematical skills. And again, the emphasis on uh, foundational skills uh, was also one of the things that really drove research and reading a few years ago and continues to drive research and better understanding how children differ in their reading abilities. So an analogy we draw in the math field is we kind of want to understand what is the phonological awareness equivalent or equivalence in the domain of math. For, the, for those of you who don't know what phonological awareness is, it's a key building block in learning how to read and it's simply children's awareness that language decomposes into units of sound. So for example that they can recognize when two words rhyme versus when they do not rhyme with one another. And there's some really fascinating research in the domain of reading that shows that even before children can decode print, even before they understand the association between letters and phonemes or between letters and speech sounds, individual differences or differences between children in their phonological awareness tells us something about how well, how well they will learn to read later on. So we really want to focus on foundational competencies and I think what, what has happened in the domain of reading is a powerful analogy to drive research in the field of numeracy and mathematics. And this is sort of a graphical illustration of what I just said. There's a lot of research in the domain of reading that clearly demonstrates that children who have good foundational skills early on, who have phonological awareness, who are developing uh, uh, phonic skills, who are mapping letters onto speech sounds, that those children <laughs> will go on to have a trajectory of growth. If they've got good foundational skills, their reading abilities will continue to grow. Whilst those children who lack those foundational skills early on are more likely to continue to lag behind their peers with good foundational skills. And this phenomenon was coined the Matthew effect by Keith Stanovich at the Ontario Institute of Education in a very long paper in 1986, which uh, if you get through it, uh, you'll get a prize from me. So do contact me if you get through it. So what do we know about the foundational competencies uh, underlying math? I'm not going to be able to cover everything we know about it, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the things that interest me the most, uh, about the foundational competencies that we're spending a lot of time in my research group studying. So there is a growing body of research that shows that children's early understanding of numerical symbols is a critical scaffold. What do I mean by numerical symbols? By numerical symbols, I mean Arabic numerals, such as those on the clock face, but I also mean number words, one, two, three, four, five. They're symbolic because their relationship to what they refer to is arbitrary. There's nothing about the symbol six that tells me that it refers to sets of six items. It's an arbitrary relationship, or what people sometimes refer to as a non-iconic relationship. And that's of course also true for number words. The number word three, there's nothing about that sequence of sounds 
that tells me that it refers to three objects. It's something that children have to learn. They have to learn those associations just like they have to learn the associations between letters and speech sounds. So let me tell you um, about one of my favorite studies that I think really nicely illustrates the importance of numerical symbols in early number development. It's called the transition from informal to formal mathematical knowledge, mediation by numeral knowledge, and by David Purper and various colleagues. It was published in 2013 in the Journal of Educational Psychology. And what David and his colleagues really wanted to understand is what are some of the things that allow children to make the transition from you know, what we in Canada refer to as kindergarten or preschool to the formal elementary school classroom. So in essence, what are some of the elements that m allow children to successfully graduate from senior kindergarten and then go into grade one? What helps children make that transition from more of a play-based curriculum to a more formal curriculum where they now have to sit down and work with sheets and so forth? There's quite a, there can be in many schools quite a dramatic difference between a kindergarten classroom and a grade one, grade two, grade three classroom. So they really want to understand how do children make that transition and what are some of the factors that play a really important role in helping them make that transition. So this is another slide with lots of numbers on it. Don't worry about the numbers too much, although this talk is about numbers, but I will take you through it. So what they did is, just like uh, the Duncan et al. paper, they took a longitudinal approach. So they followed children over time. So when children were in you know, junior kindergarten, senior kindergarten, they measured what they called their informal mathematical knowledge. Things such as counting, one-to-one -one counting, cardinality, which if you don't know what it is, I'll spend a lot of time talking about that, so I won't define it for now, set comparison and story problems. And then a year or two years later, they measured their formal knowledge using standardized tests of things such as arithmetic and uh, being able to order symbols and so forth. So what they found, what is signified by this 0.84, is that there was an incredibly strong relationship between the informal and the formal mathematical abilities. That is, children who did well on these kinds of mathematical problems in senior kindergarten and junior kindergarten were also those children who did well on those calculation tests in grades one and two. And that's not particularly interesting because we already know from Duncan's work that that should be the case, that early skills should predict later skills. But they went further than this and they asked, well, what is the role of numeral knowledge in this? By numeral knowledge, they meant how well do children actually understand numerical symbols, such as the Arabic numerals. And they did so by using two different uh, tasks. One of them is called numeral ID, which is simply children's ability to name an Arabic numeral. So for example, they were shown the eight and were just asked, what number is this? And they measured how correct the children were on this task. And then in addition to that, they had a set to numeral task. So what happens in this task is that children have to pick which of these sets of dots matches the Arabic numeral. So they have to have an understanding between uh, the concrete and the abstract representation of number. Right? And what they found was that this, these two tasks completely explained the relationship between informal and formal knowledge. And what we might conclude from that is that those children who have better numeral knowledge are better able to make the transition from informal to formal education. So that suggests then that learning about number symbols, learning their names, and learning how number symbols connect to quantities is really critical early on. It doesn't suffice just to work with concrete materials, but children need to be introduced to number symbols early on in order to make that transition successfully. So I want to talk a little bit about what is involved in children learning about number symbols. When a young child sees number five, maybe a two-year-old, unless they're very precocious, they won't know what that means at all. They won't know the name of it. They won't know what quantity it refers to. It's just a squiggly line on a page. 
So number, learning about number symbols is actually incredibly complex if we sort of think about the various things that children have to learn that these symbols refer to. So first of all, the number symbol five refers to all sets of a quantity of five. That's the quantity symbol relationship, right? This five refers to any set of five that we might find in the world. Five people, five lambs, I'm just picking stuff in the room, five cars five sounds, um, it's a very abstract reference for the quantity of five. And that's what we refer to as the symbol's cardinality. But five conveys more than just uh, information about a set size. A number, in this case five, a numerical symbol, is also part of a sequence and therefore it carries positional or rank information, the fifth runner in a, ra in a race, for example can only be understood by understanding the relationship between symbols, by understanding that four comes before six, but after, uh, but after four. So those are the kind of the symbol-symbol relationships. Then children, of course, just like for letters, have to learn that numerical symbols are part of a visual category, and therefore that there is invariance. That means that Five means the same thing regardless of what font size or font type I printed in. Seems trivial, but it's some, a generalization that has to be learned. And it's a, an aspect of learning about numerical symbols. And then, of course, children have to learn how to transcode, how to understand that five is the same thing as the symbol five. So the number word five is the same thing as the Arabic numeral in the middle of the screen there. And it doesn't just stop there, because when you get into multi-digit number processing, so when you, for example, have 113, now you have to process uh, the position in a multi-digit number sequence and understand how that position affects its value. So there's lots of things that children have to learn, and I think sometimes as adults, because most of us are very <coughs> fluent at processing Arabic numeral, when we open that newspaper and we read a statistic, we read a percentage, we can understand that very rapidly without even thinking about it. But that's because we went through a long trajectory of learning, of understanding all these multiple reference of these numerical symbols. So children, of course, first learn about cardinality, so the association between symbols and quantities the fact that five refers to all possible sets of five in the world, they first learn about that for number words, and then, only then, for Arabic numerals. And there's a very nice recent paper from a research group at Carlton University, led by Joan Lefebvre, uh, who've actually d demonstrated this in a longitudinal study. So how can we find out whether children know the cardinality of number words, right? How do children, when do children actually start to understand that number words are more than just something that they recite in sequence, right? Very young children can count, they count, but they don't necessarily know what the purpose of counting is. They don't know how numbers, number words, and quantities relate to one another. So there's several options we could take, right? For example, if you're a parent of a three-year-old, you might say, well, I can find out something about how well my child understands the link between number words and quantity by just asking them to count as high as they can. And that would be good if they can do that, if they can recite the sequence in order. That's fantastic. But a child might be able to count until 10, but have no understanding that 10, the last word in the count sequence, refers to a set of 10 items. So that might not be such a good option. I think if we ask children to count as high as they can, we're assessing their procedural understanding of number. We're understanding their ability to recite the count sequence, but we don't really un assess their understanding of what that counting does for you. That counting allows you to determine the number of items in a set. We could ask them to count a row of objects and tell me how many there are. That might be an option. I might put you know, five apples in front of a child and ask them to count them. And they go one, two, three, four, five. And I, then I ask them, so how many are there? Well, many children will go again, one, two, three, four, five, because they understand that question as, oh, maybe I should just recount. 
So then you don't know. Uh, do they know that there are five objects or have they misunderstood my question? So I want to introduce you to a task that we use in the lab that I think gets around some of these problems. It's called the given number task. This is my son, Leo, uh, and this is Mariah Zokolowski, who's a uh, PhD student in my lab. And Leo was kind of our uh, test subject for any new task that we were developing for that age group. That's why his facial expression is like, not again. <laughs> but he's doing the given number task here. And what the given number task involves is it's sort of a game where Mariah says, Leo, this is my friend Dino. And Dino really likes to eat green squares. Can you give him two green squares? And then Leo has these green squares in front of him. In this case, he got it right. At that point, he was just what we refer to as a two-knower. Because he could only give the correct number when asked for one and two. As soon as Mariah would ask him for three, he would just give her either all of them or two again. He had no understanding of how the number word three connected to three items in front of him. He didn't understand that relationship between the number word and the set size that was requested. So this task is really good because it gets around putting the count sequence into the task. It allows children to produce their knowledge, to show you what they know if you ask them for a specific number. So here's Leo again doing that given number task. And I can, I can say with some confidence that now he is he understands the cardinality principle. He can do this for any number, but I should get Mariah to come back and test him again. <laughs> so I'm sure he would be thrilled about it. No, genuinely, he would be. So with the given number task, what you can do, and you can try this at home if you've got a child who's still sort of gra grappling with how do count words connect to quantities. You can use this task to really establish at which level is a child in terms of their knowledge of cardinality, their knowledge that counting allows you to determine the quantity of a set or the number of items in a set. Because children go uh, through a sequence of starting out as a one-knower. They can only give you one, but as soon as you ask them two, they might give you everything. Then they are two-knower, three-knower, four-knower, and then finally they are what we refer to as a cardinality principle-knower, at which point they can give you any number that is in their count sequence, any number that they can already count to. And this process takes a lot of time, which again shows just how complex it is to learn about number symbols, because number words like Arabic numerals on the clock face are abstract symbols of quantity. There's a developmental trajectory between the ages of two and five. So some textbooks will say, by three and a half, all children will be cardinality principal knowers. Well, guess what? Many of those children were tested on the campuses of Ivy League universities in the United States, and they don't consider that there's a lot of variability. When we have used this task here in London and the surrounding areas, we found great amount of variability. But even some five-year-olds aren't yet cardinality principal knowers. So you might ask yourself, why is he going on so much about cardinality? It seems trivial, you know, eventually all children get there. Well, there's some really good research to suggest that Acquiring cardinality gives you a real head start in learning about number symbols more generally. So some really nice work that's been published very recently. This is 2016, and there's even a 2018 paper showing similar things that when children understand the cardinality principle, it starts to scaffold their development. And you see that individual differences in cardinality knowledge early on predict something about how well children learn arithmetic. Then here's the 2018 paper, which shows that once children have the cardinality principle, once they understand how count words refer to quantities, it is at that point that their symbolic number knowledge really accelerates and takes off. So it's one of those really key building blocks. It's the earliest foray of children developing an abstract understanding of number and a symbolic understanding of number. So how do we assess cardinality with slightly older children and even adults? Well, one paradigm that we and others have used in the lab is called a number comparison paradigm. So you're simply asking children, for example, to touch on a screen the larger of two numbers, the numerically larger of two numbers. And of course, you can do also do this with what we refer to as non-symbolic stimuli, actual quantities such as sets of dots. And again, you ask them to choose which one of these two is numerically larger. And you can measure their reaction time, how fast they are at doing this, or also how accurate they are at doing this. 
Why do we think this task is important? Well, I think there's several elements that make it a really nice task to capture understanding of number. First of all, you've got to be able to recognize those numbers, and then you've got to be act able to activate in your mind the quantity that they refer to, and then engage in a process of comparing those quantities. So it requires quite a rich understanding of number symbols that can be assessed through this task. And we and many others have found in our research that uh, individual differences, so differences between people and how well people do on this task, tells us something about their mathematical skills more generally. So quite a few years ago now, um, I had a student who was a master's student in the Faculty of Education, and she came to my lab and she wanted to study neuroscience, she wanted to study the brain. And I said, that's good, you know, let's, let's do that, let's do this, we studied, started this brain imaging study. And at some point she came into my office and she said, this is taking me too far away from education. I want to go back there. And I said, you know, let's try something else. Let's try to think about a, a way in which we can translate some of the work we've done on number comparison into a practical application. And what Nadia came up with was a paper and pencil test of symbolic and non-symbolic number comparison. It's a very simple test. Children are simply instructed to cross out with a pencil the larger of two numbers or the larger of two dot arrays. And what Nadia was interested in for her PhD was understanding whether differences between children, differences in how many items children could complete on this uh, two minute paper and pencil task, whether they told us something about differences on their performance on a test of math fluency, which is do as many of these calculation problems as you can in three minutes, and calculation, which is do as many problems as you can with no timing constraints. Because we wanted to understand whether perhaps we could use this paper and pencil test to identify children who might be at risk of falling behind before it's too late and before too many years of schooling uh, have elapsed. So what Nadia found um, uh, by administering this test to 160 grade one to grade three students from Thames Valley District School Board uh, schools was that indeed there is a correlation between how well children did on this two minute paper and pencil test and their math fluency scores in this case. So you can see those children who did better on Nadia's two minute paper and pencil test were also those who uh, uh, scored higher on the math fluency test and also on the calculation test. So this made us happy because we thought, you know, at least this two minute paper and pencil test is capturing some meaningful differences between children not just in how well they know number symbols, but it also seems to tell us something about their calculation abilities. And we went a little bit further because we had both the dot comparison version and the Arabic numeral comparison version. We wanted to find out which of these two versions is kind of the most critical. And what we found out was that whilst there was a relationship, as you've just seen, for both symbolic and non-symbolic, it was much stronger for symbolic. And this is very technical, uh, this sentence here, I realized that we found that only symbolic accounts for unique variance. What do you mean by unique variance? By unique variance, I mean that once you've taken into account all sorts of other things, performance on the symbolic comparison task still tells you something uh, about how children differ on the tests of, uh, of arithmetic. That's even when you take into account things such as working memory, which is the ability to hold in mind a limited set of information while you're doing something else, intelligence, as well as reading ability. So this really told us, consistent with other data that I've already shown you, that processing of number symbols is really critical. And that working with you know, concrete materials is very important, working with actual quantities is very important, but introducing those symbols is, seems to be critical early on. Now, the first study that Nadia did was a purely correlational study in the sense that she tested children on her two-minute paper and pencil test and on standardized tests of arithmetic at the same time, in the same session. What we wanted to find out is, what if you give this two-minute paper and pencil test to children in senior kindergarten? Can it tell you anything about how well they end up doing later on? So that at that point in time, we had the, uh, uh, the privilege to be able to work with nearly 270 children in senior kindergarten. These were children from the Toronto District School Board. 
they completed the paper and pencil test and then the uh, TDSB permitted us uh, access to their grade one grades in an anonymized fashion. So now what we could do was to ask the question, well, we administered this test in senior kindergarten, does it tell us anything about how well teachers think they're doing in grade one? And what we found was yes, and especially so for the symbolic version of the test. So being able to quickly compare number symbols in senior kindergarten was associated with higher grades across four strands of the Ontario curriculum in grade one. This wasn't so strongly the case for the dot comparison version of the task. So again, the symbolic version of the task really told us most about how well children were doing uh, around nine months after they had been administered the two minute paper and pencil test. If you're interested in this test, um, it's very much a screener. Our development of it is very much in infancy, but we have put together a website where you can download uh, the test, you can administer it. There are videos that tell you how to, uh, the background to the test, there's some research papers that you can download. Um, and you can also uh, get some reference norms. So, uh, and that's why it's a, a big beta across the top because the reference norms are still under development. But if you're in the London area, they should be fairly representative because most of our data has come from this area. So we're hoping to scale this website and make uh, uh, more reliable uh, norms <coughs> of this test and also uh, do this in various countries throughout the world. That's the aim. And it's completely free, which is often not the case for these kinds of uh, tests. You have to, you have to pay. Our, our ambition is to, to keep this free and accessible so it can be used as, as one of many tools that you might use to get a better sense of where a child is, say, in senior kindergarten or in grade one. It's by no means a diagnostic test at all. Now, I've talked a lot about uh, cardinal processing, the ability or the, the children's developing understanding of how symbols refer to quantities. But remember in that slide with all the arrows and the five in the middle, I also talked about ordinal information processing and being able to understand that numbers are part of a sequence. Well, we've also been looking at that because, of course, number symbols are part of an ordered sequence and therefore, as I've already said, carry this positional rank information. So the way we've been going on about that in the lab is to ask children to verify whether a particular sequence of numbers is in order or not. So 135 is in order. 315 isn't, so hopefully a child would say, yes, this is an order, no, this isn't an order. And then we wanted to understand, well, how well does that, uh, how, how, how much can we learn from this measure about their math abilities? Well, this is data from a, from a study with children in grades one to six. These are children in the Netherlands, because we had an opportunity to work with a research group in the Netherlands. The take home message from this rather complicated looking slide is basically, that this yellow line is how much performance on this ordinality task, judging whether a sequence of three numbers is in order or not, tells us about children's arithmetic abilities. And what you can see is early on, doesn't seem to matter very much, but by grade six, it's a really strong predictor of individual differences, of differences between children in terms of their mathematical abilities. And that contrasts a little bit uh, with the number comparison one, where it's early on, it's very important, and then its importance seems to decline. And that's interesting. We're still trying to understand what that really means. But I think ordinality may be an indicator of an increasingly more sophisticated abstract representation of number symbols. Now, I want to talk a little bit about uh, brain imaging and cognitive neuroscience, what it can tell us about foundational skills. And whenever I talk about this, the first thing I want to say is that brain imaging is not a source of evidence that's better than other pieces of evidence. Brain imaging is just another way of understanding the complexities of humans and the complexities of learners and uh, the complexities of child development. Because I think neuroscience has been undergone such a hype and people really think that you know, these colorful maps with brains are somehow a piece of evidence that's superior to a paper and pencil test. I would tell you no. I would tell you yes, it's interesting to look inside of the brain and we can, we've got these amazing tools to do so. But one should never think that uh, a brain scan is a better piece of evidence than another way of assessing what children know and how children represent the world around them. So one of the things we've learned from brain imaging, when we stick somebody into the scanner, 
Uh, hopefully they're not claustrophobic. And uh, believe me, we have lots of ways of trying to prepare children for this because it is a very unusual experience. But it can be a fun one too. We try to make it fun. When we put people in the scanner, we ask them, for example, to compare which of two numbers is larger. Lots and lots of research has shown for the past 30 years or so that areas in and around what we call the intraparietal sulcus, highlighted here in yellow, are activated when people do math, when they compare numbers, even when they do higher level math, such as algebra and calculus. This is a bird's eye view, by the way, of the brain. So if you were looking, uh, if you were standing above me looking down on my brain scan, that's what you would see. This would be the back of my brain. This would be the front of my brain. So these areas in and around the intraparietal sulcus towards the back of your brain seem to be really critical for number processing. That doesn't mean that they don't only do number processing. In fact, this brain region does a lot of different things, which is part of the reason why brain imaging is so hard, because brain areas are involved in a lot of different things. But this area seems to be, in addition to doing lots of different things, also be involved in number processing. And one of the really fascinating things is that when it comes to these non-symbolic representations of dots, this brain system seems to be responsive to quantity and changes in quantity from a very early age onward. So you can see activation in this intraparietal sulcus region, even in babies, in young children, and then in adults. And you can see the similarity in the location of the activation, doing very similar ways of assessing people simply looking at dots, and occasionally they change in the number of dots in the display, and then you look at what happens in the brain. So when it comes to processing quantity, this brain system seems to be there from a very early age. Of course, with symbols that we have to learn, things might be a little bit different. So one of the ways we've been using brain imaging is to better understand brain behavior relationships, to maybe be able to better understand how the brain sort of serves as a mediator between, for example, number symbol understanding and being able to do calculations. So a few years ago, uh, a graduate student of mine who's now a postdoctoral fellow at Penn University in the States, Stephanie Bugden, and Perry was actually uh, on her examination committee, if I remember correctly. She was also a, a master's student in the Faculty of Education. And she, uh, for her master's uh, thesis, I said to her, Stephanie, you've been in my lab. She was an undergraduate. You've been in my lab for a number of years. You can, do a ma you can do a brain imaging study for your master's thesis. She said, no, I can't. We said, no, no, you can. And she did it. Uh, and uh, it turned out to be a, a really great experience. Um, and for the final sample, so one of the problems with putting children into the MRI machine, it's not necessarily that they don't enjoy it, but they move around a lot. And it's like a camera, so if you move around, then the images are gonna be blurry and we're not gonna be able to do anything. So I think Stephanie actually had more than 30 children in her total uh, sample of children, but she was only able to use data from 17 children. And what she did is in the fMRI scanner, she asked them to compare which of two numbers is larger, and when they came out, she also assessed their math and reading skills. And what she wanted to know was, is there an association between doing this number comparison task and brain activation? And does that tell us anything about how well the children did on the standardized uh, measures? So in other words, is there something different about a child who's really mathematically fluent when they're comparing numbers in terms of their brain activation? And here's what Stephanie found. Again, she found that this number comparison task was associated with activation in this intraparietal sulcus area. But much more interesting, she found that those children who activated this brain area more were also those children who did better on a math fluency test. So what we take away from this is that this left intraparietal sulcus region somehow seems to be a mediator from a brain perspective in the relationship between symbolic number processing and mental arithmetic. So this is just one example of how cognitive neuroscience can make some contribution to our understanding of, uh, of mathematical development. Now, I know I'm running out of time, but I do want to tell you about this and then just briefly talk about the last thing because I think I'll get a question about it. So I prepared some slides in advance of a question. The stuff that I've been telling you about, the work that I've been telling you about is all correlational so far. And that's a problem, right? Because when two things correlate with one another, when two things co-occur in essence, it doesn't mean that one thing causes the other thing. It doesn't mean necessarily, if, if Nadia and I find that symbolic number knowledge in senior kindergarten predicts teacher grades in grade one, 
that doesn't mean that symbolic number knowledge caused those grades. Right? In order to really understand causal relationship, what we need to do is training studies. Essentially, we need to empirically measure the process of education. That's a powerful way of getting at causality. So all of this correlational data that I've shown you really raises the question whether training symbolic number early on enhances arithmetic achievement. I just want to tell you about two studies that I think illustrate that there might be some leverage here in using, in training early on symbolic number knowledge and thereby enhancing children's calculation abilities. So this paper by Honora and, and Noel, what they did is they had two different training conditions, a, a non-symbolic one with dots and a symbolic one with dots, and children had to, for example, in this one, you know, match the size of the bear to the cardinal value of the Arabic numeral displayed. And of course, you cannot do this task if you don't understand the relationship between seven and the quantity that it refers to. And they did the same thing for non-symbolic. Then they would do this also with number lines, which turned out to be a really nice way of uh, teaching kids about number symbols. And in this case, children simply had to press, had to uh, place uh, this swatch of dots on this continuum, or uh, place this Arabic numeral on this continuum as well between, in this case, 1 and 20. And what they found was that the group of children that had been trained using the number symbols did much better in terms of their growth. T1 refers to before training. T2 refers to after training. Those children who did the symbolic training, they grew a lot more in terms of their arithmetic development. Those children who did the non-symbolic training showed some growth, but it wasn't significant. And those children who were in the control group who didn't receive any training, surprise, surprise, they didn't improve. But this is, I think, some nice evidence to suggest that strengthening children's understanding of number symbols will lead to some improvement in their arithmetic abilities as well. One very simple uh, alternative to this, or something that you could do in addition to that, is simply playing board games. So Bob Siegler and Gita Ramani at Carnegie Mellon University and University of Maryland have done some really nice work working with children from low SES backgrounds and playing board games with them. And what they've looked at is board games such as this, where numbers are either printed on the spinner that is used to determine how many positions uh, to move ahead on this uh, race game, the great race, rabbit and bear. So one of you is rabbit, the other one is bear. And you, 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 know, you operate the spinner and then you move uh, the corresponding number of uh, places ahead or you simply operate by color. And they wanted to know, is the simple difference between these two games, in this case you have Arabic numerals printed, in this case you don't, does that make a difference? And yes, it turns out it does. It makes quite a large difference that's summarized in this slide. Basically, the take home from this, if you don't want to focus on the details, is that the open triangles are the children who played the number board game and the uh, dark uh, squares is those children who played the color board game, pre-test, so before playing the game, post-test, and then a few months afterwards. And you can see a tremendous differentiation. Those children who played the game with the digits printed on the spinner and printed on the race card improved a lot more. I'm going to skip over this, but if you wanted to uh, talk to me about it afterwards, we can talk about it. Now, one of the things that I get asked quite often when I talk to educators, especially early childhood educators and the teachers working in junior and senior kindergarten classrooms, they say, oh, you talk so much about symbols, Daniel. It's manipulative. And we can't, you know, how are we going to play with symbols? Well, it turns out that there are lots of really great examples, uh, pictures that I found on social media and on classroom websites of activities that are play-based and that therefore don't conflict with the current you know, trends in education towards more play-based in the early years, which I think is, uh, is, is very positive. But there are ways, of course, of playing with number symbols. So this is a very simple matching game. And there's so many things going on in here. There's cardinality going on by matching the number symbols to the corresponding quantities. But there's also something about the invariance of the dot representations here, that children learn, no matter how the uh, dots are, in this case, I guess it's... Uh, it squares, no matter how they're arranged on these uh, cards, they still refer to the same symbol. So it's building abstraction. Then there are these wonderful uh, learning carpets. Again, a lot going on in terms of cardinality. 
uh, but also in terms of invariance, in terms of the size of the Arabic numerals. And of course, one can have conversations about cardinality, but we can also have conversations about ordinality. This can be scaled in many different ways, as is illustrated here, where you're now building in shapes and geometry and linking that back to the symbols and the cardinal values that they represent and the ordinal relationships. And of course, there's very artistic ways of doing this. So this is a question that I always get in my talks. So instead of addressing it in the Q&A session, and we can elaborate on it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about it because we recently simply said to ourselves, we get this question so often, we need to look in our own data whether gender plays a role. And I think this question is important because unfortunately, there are lots of gender stereotypes in society about math. You know, the talking Barbie doll who says, one of the things she says is math class is tough, right? So there's a, in many materials that we find in children's toys and children's books, there are implicit associations between being bad at math and being a girl, right? And that's very unfortunate. So given these gender stereotypes, let's look at whether those gender stereotypes are actually supported by data. Is it actually true that female students perform worse on math tests than male students? Well, actually there's a lot of evidence that suggests that that is absolutely not true. So there's some really, really powerful work by a researcher at the University of Wisconsin, Madison Janet Haidt, who's published a lot of work on this, and she's put forward the gender similarities hypothesis. She says the overwhelming amount of data that we have from studies with literally Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of students suggest that boys and girls perform very similarly on standardized tests of uh, math achievement. So this is actually from the uh, magazine Science, uh, which is you know one of the most famous uh, uh, scientific publications. And this is again a full of numbers. The take home from this is here you can see the number of participants in each of these grades that were tested. And this is the magnitude of the difference between boys and girls. One thing that I hope you notice is that it's very, very close to zero, <coughs> right? So these data across grades, from grades 2 to 11, suggest gender similarities in mathematical abilities rather than gender differences. But given our interest, we also wanted to know whether this is true for basic number processing. So recently we published a paper um, uh, in which we looked at various measures of basic number processing. So things such that I've talked about today. Number comparison, dot comparison, number ordering, counting, number line estimation, basic arithmetic, and so forth. And we had data from nearly 1,500 students from grades 1 to 6. This is, this is the data from the Netherlands. And what we found here is illustrated in this graph here. Whenever you see a black line, that is evidence for gender differences. I'm not talking about which direction now, but that just says gender differences. Whenever you see a, uh, a white uh, bar, that means there's actually evidence for the absence of gender differences. We analyze this using a statistical method called Bayesian statistics. If you want to learn more about that, I can talk to you about that. But the takeaway is literally when you look at this, there's overwhelming evidence for gender similarities. And not much evidence for gender differences. For example, here in counting, uh, uh, girls perform better than boys, but that increased as a function of grade. Same was true for number line estimation, where we found perhaps the largest evidence for gender differences. Again, we found that that increased as a function of grade. So it's not as though children come into grade one showing these gender differences, they emerge. But the overwhelming picture for these very basic foundational competencies is that there is no good evidence for gender differences and much more evidence for gender similarities. So now I'm running out of time, so let me just summarize. I hope what I've shown you today is that symbolic number knowledge is critical, and that symbolic number knowledge involves a lot of different things, <coughs> being able to name, understanding cardinality, ordinality, spatial mappings, and therefore working with children on symbolic, non-symbolic connections is really critical early on. Developing fluency with the use of numerals, not just teaching them what they what they're called, but helping them to understand their meanings and helping them to understand how uh, they fit into an ordered sequence. <coughs> working with number lines or working with linear board games, if you've got a dusty copy of Snakes and Ladders at home, bring it out, play it. 
making numbers salient. Numbers are incredibly abstract, helping children to identify numerical relationships in their environment. The last thing I want to say is all the things that I didn't talk about that are really important for math and didn't have time. Spatial cognition is really important. Working memory, this ability to hold information online when you're, you know, you, you're working on something. Let's say a trivial example. You're, you're, uh, you're trying to keep in mind the quantities in a recipe and your child comes in and asks you a question. Your working memory is needed for holding that information about the recipe online. Emotional factors, math anxiety plays a role. Phonological awareness is correlated with math. Executive functions such as the ability to inhibit certain pieces of information while focusing on something else. Language turns out to be really important. We live in a multilingual society. There's differences in the way in which language represent, <coughs> represents numbers. And of course, teachers are critically important for children's math development. There should be a lot more errors on this slide. I think they've put enough. All of the other things, of course, work together as well. So, and importantly, all of these different components uh, emerge at different uh, points in development. So one doesn't necessarily need to ask the question, is it basic number processing or is it working memory? It's both. It just depends on the level of the learner and where they're at in their developmental trajectory. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention and uh, happy to take questions. I realize it's already 8 o'clock, so if you need to run out, run out. But I'll stick around if you, if you wanted to ask some questions. Thank you. That's why we're using microphone. It's not amplified. It's just to send a signal to the recording. I noticed that you have in your cards where you were showing circles. Some circles were bigger and some were smaller. Mm -hmm. So is there any specific reason for it? Or Yes. So this is kind of more a, a research problem than one for education. I don't think it matters so much helping children understand quantities. But the problem is when you, let's say you have a group of eight dots and a group of six dots, and they're all the same size. Well, now the eight dots are also going to have an average larger perimeter, average area. So now you don't know whether children are focusing on the number of dots or are they focusing on the area or the size of the dots. So by randomizing, the individual size of the dots, the density, the way they're arranged, the hope is that children concentrate more on the number of dots rather than these other things. But even when we do that, we can't be sure of that. That's one of the big problems in the dot comparison literature. If you're interested, that's a, there's some very active debate around, <laughs> around how to best design these, these kinds of dot stimuli. But that's basically the reason why we do that. Uh, did you also, in your work, did with actual items? say of the same size, so they would understand. You mean like three-dimensional, like actual yeah. objects? We yeah. haven't done that yet, no. no. Except for when we look, of course, at counting development, then it's all with, with actual concrete three-dimensional objects, yeah. Um, yes, Dr. Um, Antari, it's always a pleasure to attend your talks, and today was no exception, you did not disappoint. And I'm sitting here generally and I'm wondering how do you find the time to manage all of this? Because I'm in my last few months of the yeah. PhD and I barely have time to be a mother, to be a full-time student, mm -hmm. to be a research assistant, to do all of it. So mm -hmm. kudos to you for being a father, researcher, I wonder where you get the time. I have um, two quick questions though. Um, not a lot of sleep. Oh <laughs> yes, I can imagine. So um, my con I come from the Caribbean and so the first question I have, in the towards the beginning you said that um, there was a correlation between um, children's early abilities in reading and math and their later performance in, in reading. Like you said, math was very important in how students do in reading. And we find in the Caribbean that, the, that if a student is generally good in math, he or she is not as good in, in English, mm -hmm. in reading, mm -hmm. and the vice versa. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering how that factors in. And the second question I have, um, I'm looking at Sweden, for example, and other Scandinavian countries where formal education for children 
doesn't begin until maybe age six or seven. Mm -hmm. So I notice a lot of the participants in your, in your studies, they come from the North American context, mostly yes. the US, Canada, Australia. Yes. So again, I'm wondering, well, how does that factor in? Is research being done with students prior to beginning age seven in those Swedish and Scandinavian countries? And yes. I'm not sure if you know of any data that yes. you can speak to, and are there any similarities, alignments, that yeah. or differences? Yeah. Yes, so thank you. there are groups working in countries like Finland on very similar questions. I'm not aware in Sweden. We haven't had the ability yet to implement our me measures in other countries, but I do expect that some of these findings will vary as a function of the context. And of course, education policy tends to be very fluid and changes can happen quite rapidly. You know, so if you consider, for example, Finland uh, more and more moving to a very, I would say, almost extreme version of preschool that doesn't you know there was a famous article that's that was called the beautiful illiterate children of Finland right and I think the effects of that on later outcomes won't be able to, we won't be able to measure them for quite some time right but I do I fully agree with you that these results may not fully generalize beyond the context of North America and that we need more work to do that and that we need more work to to actually be able to assess how the individual educational jurisdictions and the way in which they implement the curriculum might affect some of these relationships. And now my working memory is failing me because... <laughs> the Caribbean. The Caribbean, yes, that's right. So I think it's really important, again, the correlation causation thing, not to take these data to uh, imply that we can go from the Duncan at our big data sets, longitudinal studies, to individual children, right? That's always the problem. We're talking about differences between children rather than individuals. So um, I, I think that the relationship here that they obtained between reading, early reading, and later math is still something we need to tease out. What does that mean? Um, we do know that uh, you know, reading and arithmetic abilities are overlapping. Uh, both, uh, you know, we know that both from cognitive studies but also from genetic studies. So there does seem to be something that drives the co-occurrence. But of course, you're always going to find in a population that uh, some children who are less uh, verbally inclined may deviate more towards uh, subjects that rely more on their spatial and nonverbal abilities. And there's certainly a lot of math that loads very strongly on nonverbal abilities. You know, I think there's a there's a lot of really great work showing just how how important spatial skills and spatial visualization abilities are for learning math. So I think it's I don't know the answer to your question. Um, but I can only speculate that uh, you know, there could be differences across context and that it's really important not to take those overall correlational results as an indication that that needs to be the case for every single child. Right. Hi. Um, my, OK, so yeah, that was wonderful. Um, I'm a teacher in grade one right now, so it was wonderful to see the importance of that. Um, so thank you for that. Um, my question is about ELL learners and how they have affected the study because of the language. Um, yeah, so that's my question. Um, I mean, that's almost a, a research question in and of itself, right? That I think, especially in Canada, we need, to, I, I mean, my lab needs to pay more attention to it. It's that you just have a limited amount of resources and time and measures that you can put into every study. But it's certainly something that we want to look at more closely. We did look at it, so we, we did collaborate with the Toronto District School Board on a large study with our screeners. And they, of course, have all that information um, about ELL status and language spoken at home. So, but I forget the specific results of the report. If you want to send me an email, I'm more than happy to send you that report from there. And that was a very, very diverse population. We, we oversampled from low SES neighborhoods, and uh, so that's. We, we can tease out some things there. Yeah. Research does show that they are behind. Yes, absolutely. So I was wondering if that connects with the language barrier. And, uh, it has to be, right? You, you would know that better than most as a teacher, just how important language is to you being able to convey something to your students in your classroom. So I don't know what the workarounds would be for that, but uh, yeah. And parents work with them at home in their own language. Right? Yeah. Yeah, but that can be difficult too, right? Because languages have diff slightly different ways of representing numbers, and so there, there's certainly some challenges there. Yeah.
Um, my question is, when you're, was it card, cardinality, the, your favorite word? Okay. My so, favorite word. <laughs> so for cardinality, you talked a lot about um, like visually seeing symbol, symbols um, and identifying them and understanding yeah. their, their concept with um, objects. So how about, because um, that to me seems like reading fluency. So is there a, a cardinality like f relationship with writing fluency in those younger e e years? Are they supposed to be able to or be working on writing the number five? Is it, or is it only a visual stimulation? Ah, Harry Klein is in the room who is <laughs> the expert on writing. So you should talk to him. But it's actually something that I really want to work on. Because very few people have, have actually worked on number writing. and how that differs from letter writing or whether it does, uh, at least to my knowledge, you might be able to recommend some sources to me. But uh, yeah, I, d I don't know the answer okay. to that question. But does cardinality refer to only the symbol aspect technically or does it, it could maybe refer to the written symbol as well? It most certainly refers to the written symbol oh, okay. because <coughs> cardinality is simply the understanding that number symbols refer to very specific number of items in a set, right. right? So that would be, yeah, the spoken number word, the written symbol, right. the symbol that you just perceive visually. I see what you mean okay. now. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Okay. Whether the process of learning to write the symbols somehow scaffolds or facilitates or deepens an understanding of cardinality, I think it's a really interesting question. Okay. Yeah. So the, the questions are really uh, interesting ones. Um, but unfortunately, our, our room booking is up. So I imagine oh, yeah. that the library will come and drag us out sometime soon. Uh, so Daniel, we'd like to thank you for your, your talk tonight. Well, we have a, a small gift for you. Um, I would estimate its volume maybe 750 millimeters. Oh, excellent. Uh, it's, it's, it's cardinality is one. And I know that because I'm a one knower. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, your, your ordinality is the most interesting speaker on mathematics education <laughs> research is certainly number one. So thank you very much. Thank you.